You're watching Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast, and this is episode number 44. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. It is great to be a part of your workout, your drive to work, your, uh, where else might you be? Um, cleaning the house. I know somebody uh, told me the other day that they clean the house while they listen to podcasts. I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, whatever it is you're doing, thank you so much for tuning in to listen to me. I really do appreciate it, and I hope that you find it really, really helpful. Today, we're talking about AMEB teaching diplomas. Now, the AMEB, as you may have realized from one of our previous episodes, is the Australian Music Examination Board. Um, And we had a look at what they do back in episode number 36, which was all about the AMEB. But today, we're talking about the teaching diplomas that they offer. And uh, we're going to get into some real depth about that because I've actually managed to find the person who wrote the syllabus. Uh, And she's now a dear friend of mine, and she lives over in Perth uh, in Western Australia. Uh, And I was very lucky to catch up with her when I was over there for a conference just a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, I'm going to talk more about uh, my guest and the episode in just a moment. But before we do that, I do want to thank today's sponsor, which is Forte School of Music. And Forte has been a huge successor in Australia with around 4,000 students and schools in all the major capital cities. And one of the founders, Paul Myatt, has been an avid writer on my blog, producing a number of different uh, very highly rated podcasts, sorry, podcast episodes and blog posts. Uh, And the great news is that Forte are actually looking for entrepreneurial music teachers who are interested in building a successful business in Australia and other countries and with the opportunity to become the master franchiser in their territory. Forte schools can build to the size that you're able to manage. Some schools are small with just a couple of hundred students while others have nearly 1,000 students and a million dollar turnover. I mean, that is huge, right? The key to success after being in business for 22 years is quality, the courses and systems, but most importantly, the teachers who offer the pedagogically sound curriculum. So the great thing about this, if you're looking to build a music school and you like the idea of group teaching in particular, then Forte School of Music has everything planned. They've got their own books, they've got their own curriculum, they teach you how to do everything and they help you along the way. If you're interested to find out more, um, then definitely contact them at Forte Music, F-O-R-T-E music dot com dot A-U forward slash business. This episode is also brought to you by My Inner Circle, which is my private community of entrepreneurial and innovative and dedicated piano teachers who are committed to sharing and building and growing and improving piano pedagogy all around the world. We've got around 150 members as I record this interview, and uh, we've got an incredibly diverse group of people, but an incredibly creative group of people in there already. So if you're interested in being challenged, you're interested in support, and you're interested in accessing all my resources, including my top-rated Piano Flix Teaching Pop Piano course, then that's what you're going to find in there. It is a fantastic place to be, and I would love to share it with you. If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're going to be a great fit to, for the community because you're already looking to improve your practice. You're looking to develop your own teaching and create those most memorable and exciting teaching moments for your students. So if that sounds like you, I want you to go to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more. Okay, so today's guest is Tess Hill. Tess Hill is one of the most well-known people in piano pedagogy in Perth in Western Australia, and for very good reason. She's been doing it for a long time, and she's incredibly talented and skilled at what she does. After childhood music education in England and Perth and teacher training at Claremont Teachers College, Tess gained extensive experience in primary, secondary, special needs and TEE, that's the year 12 level education. Her background in psychology and remedial work has equipped her with particular expertise in addressing individual needs in the learning process. And this is something that I know that she is brilliant at. And she teaches all her students from her own curriculum resources that she's developed herself. Now, while she doesn't teach uh, particularly many students, uh, child, children, adults, uh, and teenage students herself today, what she's instead decided to focus on is the teaching of other teachers. And in this, she is incredibly, incredibly um, well sought after for her skills. Um, and the way that she's able to share her passion and love for teaching and the way she teaches with other teachers is just extraordinary. Um, and you've actually met one of her teachers 
in episode number 34, where we were talking about building a piano community with Laura Kahar. And I'm gonna add to this podcast a little testimonial from Laura about her experience of completing an AMEB teaching diploma and what that meant for her, what she gained from it. I'll pop that on just before we have a chat to Tess in this interview. So Tess uh, lives over down in Mandra, which is about an hour south of Perth. Uh, as I say, I went to visit her. She um, has this beautiful house um, and a lovely husband, Bevan, and they really looked after me when I went down to visit them recently. So it was great to catch up with her um, and find out a little bit more about what she's been doing and see her place, her studio in action. But what you're going to find out today is all about this concept of the teaching diploma, the AT must A, as it's called over here in Australia, and the CT must A, which Tess recommends people consider doing before the associate, the diploma level. Now, if you're not in Australia and therefore aren't looking to do a teaching diploma of this kind, can I recommend that you still listen to this episode? Because a lot of what we talk about is obviously pedagogically related, but also could very much enhance any kind of teaching diploma that you end up might end up doing. And of course, we all know that uh, the piano teaching community is unregulated. There's no real barriers to entry. You don't have to complete any kind of courses. Um, and so it's often hard to find out or work out what's best to do. So if you're looking for that next level of training, uh, and this sounds interesting, then make sure you tune in. Tess is a fabulous person to speak to, and I really enjoy this interview. Without further ado, here is my interview with Tess Hill. Hi, my name is Laura Kaha. I'm a piano teacher based in Sydney. I run my private teaching studio called Music and Me and teach 70 wonderful students ranging from 3 to 17 years old. My teaching journey began 12 years ago as a result of a lost poker game. I found myself applying for a piano teaching job from a newspaper advertisement and as soon as my mother found out I was about to teach a child, she called up my teacher Tess Hill and who straight away said, right, let's get on to your seventh grade practical and teach you how to be a teacher, which was the beginning of my CT Masse and AT Masse journey. Being Mrs. Hill's student from a young age, I was exposed to and had always been surrounded by teachers who were studying their CT Masse and AT Masse. I heard stories about their lectures, I watched them perform at our concerts, and of course I saw their success upon the completion of their studies. For me, the three greatest impact that the CT Masse and um, AT Masse has um, benefited me is a I have a clear vision of the teacher I am um, from day dot I'm clear on my philosophy um, who I want to teach why I want to teach um, what I want to teach and how I want to teach which is um, of course the first assignment that you um, have to complete in both CT Masse and AT Masse um, secondly, I think both studies have given me so much confidence in um, what I do um, because I gained so much knowledge through my studies. Um, and lastly, I think studying both um, have really made me want to continue learning um, and, and be a learner. Um, and my teacher always said to me, you know, a teacher in the end is always a learner. Um, the CT Masse um, took me two years. Um, here's my resource file, actually. Um, and during that time, I was first year uni. Um, I was working as an assistant accountant. I had a little shop with my best friend. Um, and I was doing my seventh grade practical as well as my grade four theory. Uh, my AT Masse took me a year and a half after that. And here's my folio um, and my practical exam file. Um, and during that time I was older. I had the foundation from the CT Masse and um, I was managing um, my parents' news agency. I was teaching uh, 40 students by then um, and I was organizing a wedding, my wedding. 
So where did I find the time? Um, I'm not much of a sleeper. So I used to do my readings and my studies during early hours. Um, for me, it worked really well because I found the house to be so peaceful. Everybody else was asleep and I, had, I was in my own little study bubble. Um, but I think if you want to do something, I think you always find a way. Um, in completing it. it might take longer than usual um, I think I probably could have um, done the CTMSA and ATMSA both in one year but due to my other commitments um, it took me longer um, why did I do both I think I had such a wonderful experience with the CT Marseille and it inspired me to continue my studies. I was so fascinated by um, the whole psychology aspect of learning and child development by the end of the CT Marseille that it was a no-brainer for me to continue to the AT Marseille and you get exposed to child development um, in AT Marseille. Okay, Tess, thank you so much for being with us today on the show. You're very welcome. Let's get straight into it. But uh, before we kind of dive into the questions about um, these teaching diplomas, maybe can you tell us just a little bit about your current teaching role for 2016? What kind of things are you actually doing? Well, I've got a, a few students, upper grade students after school. I'm gradually tapering off those. But I've got a number of pedagogy students, too, at the moment, who are uh, actually actively working on the CT Marseille. I have a number of casual teachers who come along just for the occasional lesson. Sometimes they're past students, CT must or AT must students who um, would like some help. They're suddenly teaching a grade six or a grade seven student and they want some ideas of extra lists or a program and or, the, or they've learned the pieces themselves. They want to come along and have a look at the difficulties and how to overcome them. That's the sort of thing I'm doing. Okay, as well as well, examining and examining with the AMEB and on the advisory committee and in contact with the federal office about pedagogy qualifications in Australia and just the odd thing like that. Mm, no, yeah, it sounds it sounds very busy. <laughs> I don't know how you do it all. Um, but look, let's talk about these diplomas because you've already used a few acronyms which people might not be familiar with: CT Marseille, LT Marseille, well, all these all these things. So we're talking about teaching diplomas. What are they? Um, and how are they relevant to the teachers who are going to be watching? Well, I, um, the Australian Music Exams Board, abbreviated to the AMEB, has three pedagogy qualifications. There's a certificate, a diploma and a licentiate, shortened to Certificate Teacher of Music Australia, CT A, Associate Diploma, Music Teacher Australia, um, AT A, and Licentiate Teacher of Music Australia, LT A. Great, and they contrast just by one letter difference with the performance diplomas, obviously. So we, you can get a performance diploma is an A Marseille, this is an AT Marseille. So people might have in fact seen it after people's names and not known what it means. So there we go, that's the teaching diplomas offered by the AMEB. Right. So how do, you, how do you see, you've worked for a long time um, in working with diplomas, you've helped put together the curriculum for them, um, so you've got a wealth of knowledge. How do you see this qualification benefiting teachers? Well, let me just make a slight correction. Um, it's not a curriculum, it's an assessment. The CT A, AT Marseille and LT Marseille are assessments of the AMEB. They are not a teaching curriculum or a teaching course. They are set out very clearly in the syllabus as to what is required and any mentoring teacher or supervising teacher would use that as a curriculum to build, to build a curriculum on what is set out for what is required for each of the assessments. Okay. And I'd see any of the grades in a similar light, to be honest. I, I don't use them as curriculum and I discourage teachers from doing the same as I'm sure you do. It, yes. is, it is an assessment. It's a guide. Uh, but it certainly shouldn't be a curriculum. So in what ways do, do the teachers get benefit from the ones you've seen? Because you've taken a number of teachers through these certificates and diplomas. How do you see it benefiting their teaching? Well, a teacher who has um, done some research in the field of pedagogy and maybe done a lot of work on textbooks, online subscriptions, all those sorts of things to expand their knowledge, not only of teaching, but of children particularly, or how people learn. It gives the teacher much more um, confidence 
in a wide area. Um, and of course, if the teacher is confident, they will teach well and the student will be happy. It'll avoid dropouts. Mm -hmm. Dropouts occur when the teacher is boring and the teaching is boring. If you do some uh, study, professional development, um, which is study and it becomes hands-on, of course your teaching is much more creative. And the uh, the more, more you read, the more you go online to see what other people do, um, join some of the like the Australasian Piano Teachers Forum, those sorts of things. It encourages you to try new ideas no matter how long you've been teaching. Mm. So uh, certainly, uh, given that it is an assessment run by the AMEB, it's not encouraging teachers to only teach to an exam assessment. Would that be a fair statement? Absolutely not, no. Right. Particularly the CT must say, which is why it's really important to attempt the CT must say before you try to attempt the AT must say. Yeah, well, and that's good because that's quite a difference, obviously, from the performance side. So we'll get we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. What would you say for teachers who already have perhaps a Bachelor of Music um, or, for example, their AMSA? Is it necessary, do you think, to take that extra step? You know, or sorry, I know it's not obviously required, but would you feel it's a good idea? Well, the, the BMUS and the um, AMUS are performance qualifications. Mm. AT mass or CT mass or LT mass are pedagogic qualifications. Too many teachers think that if they can play, if they can do something, they can teach. Teaching is an art, but it also has to be learned. And it involves um, information and understanding of um, child development, which might um, mean intelligence, understanding intelligence, understanding motivation, understanding the learning process, understanding children's different ways of learning, individual differences in children. I could go on forever and ever. Mm. This is the that I do. Mm. Um, so it's very different from performance. Of course, a teacher needs to be able to perform. Mm. But I've had too many people come to me who have their eighth grade or AMUS thinking they can just do it and they want to do their ATMUS. When they look at what they have to do for the CTMUS, they realise why I'm suggesting to them that it's better to do those three found the foundational years because the CT must covers the first three years from a beginner to um, first grade, and right. those first three years are very very important. Mm, absolutely. Um, okay, so before we go into what each exam entails, what's the overall cost? Uh, approximately, obviously, that's going to depend on how many lessons you might have with a supervising teacher. But approximately, you know, what, what kind of cost in time and money would it take to get, for example, the CT must say? Well, you need to consider, first of all, the, that there are four assessments in each of those, certificate, diploma and licensure. And for, the, for example, the written exam is $125. The actual fee, enrolment fee, right. is a $25 for the written exam, same for the resource file, and then you've got the practical repertoire exam, which is 185, and the teaching ability exam, which is 185. So for the CTMUS assessment with the AMEB, you are going to pay eventually $620. Okay. For, and that can be done over six years. You don't have to do it all in the one year. This is okay, another. That's good to know. Understand. So you don't have to trump up. $620 <laughs> at the one time. And for the ATMUS, it, it adds up to 675 Great. May I just mention with the LTMUS, we have not had an LTMUS for many, many, many years, I don't think in Australia. So when I actually contacted the state AMEB this morning, they said, if anybody's interested, contact your local AMEB and we'll sort that one out. But okay. there is a set enrolment fee for the LTMUS exam because we've had no one do it for such a long time. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's to answer one part of your question. Yeah, thing. and the other question, I guess, is re-teaching. Re yeah. Uh, well, it, it depends on who you choose as your supervising teacher, or your mentor, whatever you want to call them, how, how many lessons you will have. I mean, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's, that's right. the answer to that one, yeah. but it will... There'll be supervising teacher lessons, there'll be textbooks you want to get, there'll be apps you might want to invest in, there might be other technology, like if you want to set up a keyboard lab because that's going to be your thing. A lot of the younger teachers want to go in for technology a lot more, of course, mm. than the 
for teachers. Um, there's fees for attendance at workshops. For example, if you're going to do the ATMUS, you need to do some work on Kodai and Orf and Dal Crows, maybe Suzuki if you're a piano teacher. And just as an aside, um, these exams, the CTMUS in particular, can be done by inst other instruments or singers. It's not just a piano qualification. Right. We pianists tend to think only. Yes, sure. So those are some of the others. There are other online expenses. They're numerous, like subscriptions or printouts, subscriptions to professional organisations like your local music teachers association or even to magazines like Clavier Companion, those sorts of things. So it's endless. The mm. amount of money you can spend is endless. I don't know whether you can see any in the background, but this is my teaching I library. can see it. The background. Great, yeah. I have a lending library for my teachers. I recommend um, two particular books as texts, and that's what's recommended in the syllabus. But then I have a lending library, and each time they come, they will swap over or they will read the relevant section um, of the lecture that I'm preparing for that week. Right. And another how long is a piece of string question, I would guess, is how, how long does it take? <laughs> Again, that depends entirely on the student. Okay. I've had a number of people who have completed it fairly quickly, but they have all been tertiary educated students. If they have done a BMAS or a B.Ed. or have been through a tertiary institution and they have research skills and writing skills, it's much easier for them. They're always, almost halfway there in just even how to do an exam or how to present the answer to a question. Mm. How when I first started, I had a group of six ladies who never, had never done any tertiary education. They'd been in the field for a number of years and they were brilliant teachers, far better than some of the later ones that I've had with tertiary education, but they struggled with method and process. Mm. So we had to work through that. So I basically had to teach them how to write an exam question. Oh, okay. So and it, it depends. It's just the same as with children. As you would agree, individual differences are huge mm. and you get a student sitting in front of you for the first time, one of your real things to do is to discern where they're coming from, what their skills are, what their learning style is. Is it auditory? Is it visual? Is it tactile? What is it? How are you going to teach? So I do exactly the same with a teaching student. Mm. Great. So I can't tell you, most of my students complete it. If they've got an eighth grade or an AMUS and I don't have to do too much work, on their technical aspect, apart from teaching them how to teach mm. tech, which mm. is a big thing, um, they can complete it in two years. I, I've had nobody who would, has done it in under two years. I've had many who've taken four or five years to do it and have enjoyed doing it because they're learning all the time and they're doing in their own students' lessons what they are learning from me as they come. Mm. It's fortnightly because I live an hour south of Perth, mm. so most who come to me come for two hours or a morning if they come from Albany or Esperance or somewhere like that. Sometimes they have to stay overnight somewhere in, in Mandurah. But that's how, so sometimes even if they're having a fortnightly lesson or sometimes even one or two whole morning lessons in a term when I will give them a whole lot of work to do and study to do on a particular topic, they'll write it up, come back to me, we'll check it out and then we go on from there. And mm. really um, the person who sets the the um, level of speed at which we work through the curriculum or the course is up to the student, mm. the, the, the student teacher. I love this idea of you, you know, you, you go to, you check in with your, your teacher, so you and you, for example, you learn some new skills, you get some guidance, and then you go and try it out on your students. So, Absolutely. You know, and that's the best way to learn, obviously, is to then go and try and teach these things. Um, and while I haven't done the, the certificate of teaching, uh, when I did my AMSA, I studied with a teacher, and I was able to do the same kind of things because the practice tips she was teaching me, I was able to pass on. So, gosh, wow. I would encourage any teacher to even if they don't do the the certificate for example of, of teaching to go and have some lessons with a more experienced teacher it is so fulfilling i would underline that how important it is anywhere anytime i get the opportunity <clears throat> to go and listen to a teacher and watch a teacher i jump at it and i've been teaching since 1961 <laughs> I was don't, don't give too much away <laughs> <laughs> i was a school teacher and i actually when i really learned to teach was when i ta taught special ed students like mm. mentally physically handicapped that's mm. when i really learned how to teach breaking everything down to the lowest 
possible um, item to be able to present um, mm. to the students so they could understand it. Mm. Gosh, that would have been a challenge, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so we've got the three levels, um, certificate, associate, licentiate. Um, you've mentioned you highly recommend students doing certificate first. Is, yes. it, is that actually a prerequisite? I mean, or if they wanted to, you know, not go, go against your advice, could they actually go for one of the higher levels? I just, um, I'm glad you mentioned the word prerequisite because in the CTMSA and the ATMSA, there are no prerequisites. They are recommendations. Right. So although the prerequisite, you might say, is a recommendation for the CTMSA to do sixth grade. Okay. And with um, ATMSA, it's eighth grade. However, with licentiate, they are prerequisites. So um, the recommendation is in the syllabus is for sixth grade for the CTMUS and for um, ATMUS it's eighth grade. And that I would only seem reasonable, I would have thought, if you're going to be teaching up to those levels. Correct. Yeah. But the CTMUS gives you um, the um, achievement to be able to do um, beginner year um, and then prelim year and first grade year. So it's the first three years the ATMUS goes from the beginner right through to fourth grade, which okay. is was actually asked to write a pre-certificate to the diploma because that's huge. The ATMUS from beginner, as you can imagine, the repertoire from beginner to fourth grade is absolutely, you have 25 pieces to prepare for the exam and you don't know which ones the examiner is going to ask you. And not only do you have to play them, you have to cite the difficulties and the strategies you would use to overcome those difficulties in the exam. Now, 25 is huge. If you've already done beginner to prelim and first grade, well, you've done that, and then you get second, third, and fourth grade. And, of course, there is more to the ATMUS exam than just um, extension of repertoire. Mm. So while there is that overlap... It, it, it obviously makes a lot of sense because you cover part of the portion of what you're going to learn anyway. That's yeah. absolutely right. And the first three years is so important. Mm. I maintain, if it, if, I mean, I think personally the, the, the most qualified teachers should be the ones teaching the beginners. I they're agree. The, they're yes. the hardest to teach, mm. the hardest to keep motivated, and you're building on a, a foundation that other teachers, when they travel around as they do these days, can build on. Mm. And, and it's obviously crucial to try and get those uh, technical aspects right from the start. It makes it much easier down the track, doesn't it? Oh, tell me about <laughs> how many and teachers where I've had to correct technique before I can teach how to teach the technique. Mm. Yeah, and many right. of them have said to me, do you know, I've never, ever heard about this when I was learning. <clears throat> I might have been 10, 15, 20 years or more ago, and they've never, ever heard about phrasing. Can you believe it? Oh. I have people say that to me. <laughs> Oh, it's a worry. It's a worry test. It's a worry. Um, while I think about it, um, going back to teaching the beginners, for example, when it comes to the exam assessment, are teachers required to follow a particular method, let's say, at the beginner levels, like the prescribed method is that they do piano adventures or, or X, Y, and Z? No, not at all. <clears throat> things that is prescribed in the written exam is that they have an understanding of up to five or six different primers, what are called primers. Mm -hmm. And one of the set assignments, because there are set assignments that go into the resource file in CTMUS and the folio in ATMUS that is on um, a survey of uh, primers. So understandably, you I require my students to teach at least four or five different primers. This is why I suggest two or one or two or three years before they actually do the exam. So they are competent then to discuss the advantages and disadvantages for that particular student of that particular primer. So it doesn't matter whether it's Hal Leonard, Alfred's Piano Adventures, Piano Pronto, Safari, whatever you like. And there are a lot of really good ones coming out now. Mm. Well, I'm glad to hear it's not restricted because, as you say, there's some great and new things come out all the time, of course. Well, some are much more suited to someone, uh, a child whose learning style is visual, for example, mm. than it is auditory. So it, it behoves the teacher to understand the learning style of the child and even the personality of the child to choose a suitable, the most suitable uh, primer. With mm. my students, my beginners, I've always had them have two primers, usually a middle C one to start with, mm. a 
alongside one of the other multi-key ones. Mm, mm, excellent. Okay, so we've talked, we've started kind of talking about bits of the CT must exam. So let's go into a little bit more detail on that one. Um, you, you first up mentioned that there's a two hour written exam. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us the kinds of things that get assessed in that? Well, there are a number of things assessed in, they're all listed in okay. the syllabus, Great. even in the written exam, the questions are actually written down, the topics of the questions. Okay, so, so we'll put a link to that on, on the show notes, definitely. Yeah. Yep. That would be a good idea. And actually, in the syllabus, it tells you that the first question is on child development, and there are there are a number of four, four topics there, and you'll be asked in the exam on two of them. Okay. And the sort of topics are the development of independence of the child, because um, we need to develop the children's own in, uh, independence as a learner, um, something on the in importance of individual needs, which I'm really really um, strong on that one and the role of relationships in teaching mm, I think this is very really important the teacher the student and the parent and then there's the ages and stages in child development I must say that the mums some of the older ones and a lot of my girls in their 30s have got young children and they have a much better understanding of child development and the difference between boys and girls mm. <laughs> Mm. It's really very interesting over the years that the students I've had, I've learned a lot from my students. Mm. I, li I like to do the same. Yeah. The second question is actually the pedagogy topics and that um, you've got to have an understanding of the knowledge of various strategies uh, in oral training, tone, touch and technique, note reading, sight reading, memorization, all those sorts of things. Right. So that's, that's the second question. The third question is on repertoire programming and that's where you might be asked to um, set out a program for a preliminary or a beginner. That's where you would use your knowledge of your primers that you've studied and that you've used or set up, prepare a, a teaching, um, an exam program for a, a good grade one student or a weak preliminary student, that sort of thing. Got so it. that's in the um, written exam. Then you've also got the presentation of a resource file which you can do over a period of time and that's really one of the most essential um, items, I think, um, assessments in the whole CTMUS. It's called a folio in the ATMUS. Okay, it's sorry, just before you go on to that, just back to the exam, you said that, that there were the four questions mm -hmm. and you prepare for all four but you only get asked about two, two of the topics, was that right? Yeah, there's actually two questions and you get on child development You've got these, all these issues like child development, importance of individual needs, role of relationships. There's actually one, two, three, four, five, and you only get asked on two in the exam, but you don't know which two. Okay, I understand. Okay. And then in the pedagogy question, <clears throat> there are 12 topics, and you get asked, um, there are four you have to answer, two are your own choice, and two are from a list from there. Right. So you can't skip anything. I, I, I wrote this syllabus and wrote this up. <laughs> so I was determined that be teachers of beginners and prelim in grade one would do it thoroughly. Yeah, I can, I can tell that now. Um, and, look, and that's why I was so pleased to have you on the podcast because to get the actual person that wrote the syllabus, this is, you know, this is what we need to, to hear. So, all right, so let's go into the resource file. Tell us a little bit that, about that or the folio, as you say, it's called for the associate. Just harking back for a moment to what you just said, mm -hmm. I wrote the syllabus from a practical viewpoint. Um, I actually showed it to several people, one of them being um, a relative who is a professor of education, and he read it through and he said to me, I can't believe this. He said, you have written from a practical point of view. He said, most syllabuses are written from a theoretical point of view by somebody who's got there, and they're not quite understandable by the people who are just coming in. So I have to emphasize that the CT must is written very much from what you are doing tomorrow with your student. Right. So you might have a problem with a relationship with a parent. So what you're studying today may help you with that. Or you may have a problem with a child who can't tuck their thumb under. What you ask me next next session what you want to teach. Mm. So not do I teach a course? But in mentoring, I ask the student, the teacher, the candidate, I should say, um, what do you want to deal with? In fact, they email me a couple of days before they come, usually the good students, and say, I've got this list of questions I'm going to ask you. Can you fit these in as well as whatever else you were going to do? Oh, that's great. That's great. It's, a, it's very much a practical um, 
syllabus. And that is um, so refreshing. It's so refreshing, Tess. It's, it's, and that's how it should be. Why, you know, why talk theory if people can't put it into practice the next day? That's how I yeah. go about all my uh, podcasts, for that matter, my podcasts yeah. and my writing. Yeah, really important. We much come from a practical aspect. Mm. We talk about the resource file mm. with CTMAS. What it needs to be is, is a, a series of um, groupings of topics um, and it's listed what topics you've got to have. It actually is there. So you can put a few um, seminars or courses you've done just showing the examiner what your spread of study has been, your spread of experience has been, and how your philosophy of teaching, which you're going to talk about in your practical exam when he questions you after you've played all your pieces, that is expressed. If you believe that children are important, they're individuals, then you must show in the resource file how you would treat individuals, how you would treat a bright student, how you would treat a weak student, and so on. So the resource file is... Um, it's the thing that causes most CTMUS students the most angst because okay. it's very revelatory of where they're coming from and it shows very quickly if they haven't actually done their homework in terms of assessing their own students mm -hmm. because it's a reflection of what they're doing in the studio. Okay, it does say have some summaries of a text. Um, I get my teachers to read through maybe two or three uh, of my library books, say, on the teaching of scales. Then they summarise them, the notes, and then they say what they thought about them. Did you agree with what this um, pedagogue said? Or is this what you do in your studio? Or is there an idea here that you might try? So that's what the resource file is all about. And it should be a help to them in future years. So I get them to prepare much more repertoire than is required and they show it to me and they play it to me and we talk about the teaching difficulties and they put that in there. But that's talking about how a supervising teacher mm. might um, about teaching for the mm. students. Mm. Uh, that sounds like it could run to quite a number of pages. Oh, so it does. It's, it's a, a lever arch file by the time it's finished. Right. For the ATMUS, you're, you're restricted to 80 pages. Okay. Yeah, well, the poor person who has to read it too, the examiners, that's a big job. That's right. <laughs> Although the examiners do find them very interesting. And what you do is you submit your resource file or in the ATMUS, the, the folio, before you do your practical exam. Right. So those two go together in actual fact. Although you can do it over six years, you need to submit your resource file before you do the practical exam because the examiner is going to read through that. And it used to be, it needs to be two or three weeks before. Mm -hmm. the, the, what I have found is that the examiner then, when the student has appeared for the practical exam, after that, they are questioned then on what's in their resource file. And you see all these little tabs, these stickers, and the examiner says, I wanted to ask you about what you meant just here. Or I see you have group lessons in your studio. Would you like to explain how you do this and why you do this? Mm. And there's not very long, but the student who is passionate about group lessons, usually they, the examiner picks up something that's slightly different from what is the norm mm. in and, uh, for, and for this reason, I suggest that not only do students include um, what's required in the CTMUS um, resource file, but I say choose something that's your hot button. You mm. know, technology is or if... What's your is, passion, yeah. What's your passion? Mm. Because that's what you're going to t talk about most passionately mm. and convince the examiner. And I'll guarantee that's what they'll pick up on. I would, as yes. I'm examining yeah. anyway. Yeah. So you, you examine this as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It must be a very specialised... I can't imagine there's too many examiners who are able to do this. No, all the examiners who do it here are school teachers. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. who examine my students have all been school teachers yeah. because we've got the pedagogy background. doesn't need to say that's the only people, mm. but in general, general terms, um, I mean, I was training school teachers long before I was training music teachers mm. in the in the state school system. Right. So I've got, you know, long way back, lots of um, ideas about how to do this. Mm. Okay, so we've covered the, the written exam, the resource file or the folio, as it's called in later exams. Now the practical exam. So you've got two parts. Yes. The repertoire performance program. So I'm picturing the student just rocking up almost like an AMUS exam and performing music at the level at which they're planning to teach. That's correct. They One prelim program and one first grade program. <clears throat> However, right. it needs to be chosen carefully and we discuss the factors in which 
you have to consider in choosing a preliminary program. For example, you don't want all slow pieces. You don't want all fast pieces. You don't all want all pieces in 4-4 time and you don't want them all in C major. This is difficult sometimes, sometime because I also wrote the with Sue Thompson the uh, syllabus for prelim to grade four <laughs> <laughs> right. many weeks ago and it's just been updated a bit. But um, there are very few pieces that are not in C major or A minor in preliminary exams. So of course. it's hard, you know, obviously. But it's but more an awareness, isn't it, of variety, a, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. showing the examiner um, all the skills that you have taught and that the student can actually perform, mm. um, the student has learned. And you do that whether you were... Mind you, a lot of teachers, when they're sending students for prelim and grade one, just pick the three easiest pieces or the three pieces that happen to be in the number 16 series or whatever. Of course, yeah. Do go through, um, you know, how to choose a program mm. for prelim and for first grade. So it's just, it, you just play straight through. But, of course, you're playing them at eighth grade or AMUS level. You're playing them at a teaching level. You're sure. not playing as a prelim or a first grade student. Yes. But after the, that exam you are then asked what are the difficulties in those pieces. Why did you choose study in A minor and not such, such and such else? And in, if, if you're choosing raindrops, how would you approach the teaching of staccato? Um, so you're going to be asked pedagogy questions about those particular pieces. And while you're sitting at the piano still and you can demonstrate things, etc. That's right. Mm. Uh, and of course, in, in the AMUS, ATMUS, you may well be asked something about the form and because you're going up to grade four, something about the, the keys, the change of keys. All the, all the general knowledge that's required for whatever grade is also required, but then you've got to know how to teach it. Mm. And you have questions on that as well, whether it's general knowledge, whether it's the key signature, time signature, why you chose the piece, how you'd go about teaching, what are the difficulties of that piece, how would you go about teaching that ornament and um and so on. Of yeah. course, in the ATMUS, there is a lot more expected in point of view of style from Baroque through classical romantic 20th century and so on. Um, you would, don't have an awful lot of time to talk about those sorts of things in the CTMUS. Although, of course, when you're teaching, if you're teaching a little bark minuet, you're going to teach it in true Baroque style and it's not all going to be legato, is it? Mm. For, yeah. That's exactly right. And I, I think, uh, I mean, these, these are great, you're just giving us some great tips for any teachers who send students for exams about ways to choose exam pieces. Sorry? <laughs> I could talk forever about that. I well, have been in a country, country town where I've had 12 students do their preliminary exam and they've played the same program and they've had the same mistake. The teacher has taught a dotted rhythm wrongly. Mm. How do you say 12 times something different? How do you as a teacher teach the same thing 12 times for the period of months? I, I just don't understand it. I cannot imagine. <laughs> it doesn't happen so much now in that we don't have whole studios coming through as much. Now you can book in, a, in Western Australia, you can say basically what week you want to go. That you don't, you don't, don't have just examinations twice a year like some of the um, other um, exam right. boards. Right. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you examine practical students also? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I imagine uh, I've often wondered as an examiner, do you still get the same pieces even from different teachers? I imagine some some pieces are more popular than others, right? Oh, very much so, very yeah. much so. Yeah. I mean, a lot of Alyssa Milnes are very popular. and so I've taught a lot of Sonny Chua. Yeah. But the books in particular love Sonny Chua, of course. Mm. I do encourage students to learn Australian, and you'll see there, even in the, um, in the syllabus, it does recommend that you include some of the current pieces from the, the OMEB books and that you include an Australian composer. Mm. It, that's, it keeps it a broad repertoire. Mm. Right? And no doubt, no uh, doubt you encourage your teachers to use the manual list too. I mean, there's oh, such great it's, music it's, there. It's rarely used, to be honest with you, except where we're required to what's in the book because I can tell you now which bar on which piece you're going to have a problem. <laughs> That's right. And look, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Australian uh, exam system, we're talking the manual list is a list of pieces that can be examined but aren't in the current syllabus books versus the pieces that are produced in books every sort of, what, five or six years? Oh, um, more often than that. More often, sorry, two or three, is it? I, I can't remember actually. Yeah, so anyway. Back yeah. three years we have a Okay, so, so that's the kind of four steps, the exam, the written exam, the resource file, and then the two parts of the practical exam. I guess they're the 
the, the, the steps of assessment. We didn't really talk about the teaching ability, that section. So that's, that's the, the practical, the teaching yes, assessment, yes. Teaching exam. It's an assessment of the candidate's teaching ability. Okay. So you bring one of your own students. All right. And I suggest bring one of your best students, the one that you relate to best. Don't necessarily need to be the best pianist, but the one that you relate to best. Right. The other thing that I need to say is that there is, Usually, um, a, a, a teacher, a candidate will bring in a student live. There is a video option if right. you're away in the country or this sort of thing. I never allow my students to do, my teachers to do that because really we're assessing the rapport between the teacher and the student as much as we're assessing the teaching skills and what is taught because, you know, your teaching is based on your um, relationship with your student, as, as you know, and you obviously with your students um, you see where they're at and you teach like that. And that's what we're looking for in the CTMAS or ATMAS exams, mm. with the rapport as well as the actual pedagogical skills that you're, you're using. So in the teacher, the, the, you might take your own student in and after the actual exam, uh, the, the lesson, which is 40 minutes, 40, 30 minutes, a 30-minute lesson, um, the student goes out. Mm -hmm. Then the examiner says... How did you assess that student? What was good? Um, did you think she did well? Um, would you like to comment on what you think are her weaknesses? Or actually, you say she's got a rhythmic weakness. How are you addressing that rhythmic weakness? Mm. What would you do in the next lesson? What did you do in the previous lesson? What would you expect to um, do with that student between now and the end of the term and the end of the year? Mm. It's, um, it's quite a... a, quite, um, a comprehensive... No, it, yes, it's comprehensive. I wouldn't say it's onerous. It's a comprehensive assessment mm. of your teaching ability. Yeah, great. And does that happen on the same day as you've performed yes. your pieces? It has to happen on the same day. Ah, so um, you go in, you, you play through the repertoire, they so quiz you about the dif difficulties mm -hmm. in the repertoire and how you would teach things, then your mm -hmm. student comes in, right. you teach them for half an hour, and then you get quizzed on that. That's wow, right. that, that is, that's, um, that's full it's on, a, isn't it? Yes. Um, I have sometimes requested, particularly if a student has come from the country, that they will be, I would um, do the teaching ability exam first. My students could do the teaching and, and then do the practical afterwards. But that's between you and your state office and how they can handle that. But the examiner or examiners are there that day. So both practical ex sections of the practical exam have to be done on the same day. Right. Wow, that, that would be a tiring, that would be an exhausting day, I bet. <laughs> exhausting but couple of it's, hours. It's usually the climax of the whole thing. You usually do the written exam mm. and then, of course, you put your resource file in as well. So it's done. Mm. When you, it's mm. done. Mm. Whatever, whatever the result, it's yeah. done. <laughs> and is it, is it a pass-fail or a graded yes. response result? Now, you have to get um, each section has 100 marks, whether it's the written performance um, or file, uh, resource file. 100 marks, you have to get 75 for each one of those. Or higher, yep. Or higher. 70, and if you fail one of them, you don't have to do all of them again. You only have to do that one again. And for a distinction, you have, <laughs> to, you have to get an aggregate of 80, which means basically you need to have a very high mark. Most of them, you have to be the grey, the sections have to be over 80 to get a distinction. Right. Well, well, look, that, that has been so useful. I know so many teachers watching are going to have found this really, really useful because, as I've said uh, and set, said in my intro, I, I get a lot of questions about it, and now I know much more about it, which is great. So let's go on. We don't have time to go as deeply into the associate and the licentiate. Um, is it just a matter of, for those exams, teaching at higher levels each time, but the content of the assessment similar? The... Um, framework structure of the syllabus is the same. You've got okay. a written exam, a, a folio, per, as I call it, uh, and performance yeah. exam in both the ATMUS and the LTMUS. But in the, as I've said, in the ATMUS, it's the complete from beginner to fourth grade right. that you're covering. And so there's a huge amount of repertoire. Also, you do have to have um, some knowledge of psychology. Uh, cognitive development, for example, how a child learns, motivation, um, those sorts of things. Also, you are required to talk about um, 
the values and the, the advantages and disadvantages of exams, group lessons, Stedfords. This is all down in the syllabus. Right. So, and the syllabus, by the way, is you can download it um, digitally. Well, you can. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was. Um, is it still they're, they're charging for it, or is it the free one? I can't remember. Uh, I don't think you're charged when you download it, but you can still buy. This is this year's one. You can still buy that, which is. Okay. $22, but I think the downloads, I think they're free. Okay, well, I'll try and find them and pop the link on, on the show notes page. Mm -hmm. mm. So you, with um, what were we talking about? Uh, the difference in the, the associate level. Something else just went through my head that I need <laughs> to talk to you. Remember, just say app to me when I finish. App. <laughs> okay, I'll write it down. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yes. So, yes, you said that the associate is teaching you up to grade four level Teaching That's ability, right. yep. yeah. But the first question is the question that a lot of people find difficult because it's really talking about information processing, um, language development, intelligence, a lot, uh, and a couple of the um, resources that are suggested are very much um, tertiary education right. um, level, and the, even the terminology. If you're not, a, I mean, I did psych at, at Teachers College for teaching, and I was struggling with some of the concepts that. They were using in those reference books. Once I got through them, I thought, "Oh, yeah, I know what they're talking about. I've done that." Okay. <laughs> but um, you it's know, hard, it's hard to read that. A level. little thing. Yeah. And in talking about resources, can I just say that the CTMUS and the ATMUS were written many, many years ago now. So the resource list is certainly for the CTMUS that I wrote is actually old-fashioned or out of date. It recommends videos. Who <laughs> plan out? A what? A what? Yeah. A what? Yes, exactly. And I have been trying to get it changed. I have actually um, compiled a list of current um, resources, which includes websites like Alyssa Mion and Tim, Tim Topham and Samantha Coates, because I think the Australian ones are really important because we are teaching Australian children. Mm. And the AMEB is the benchmark in Australia, and I encourage students to do that. I think the other um, qualif other um, assessment bodies are very good, but they're for, more specific for the areas in which they're um, written. Mm. And ANSCA is also another one. Um, if you are interested, and I think a lot of country folk are more interested in ANSCA. But um, coming back to how the ATMUS is different, that first question on psychology is one that does people do sort of fall over a little bit. Is that and in the written exam? That's in the written yeah. exam. In the written Also in the written exam, you are required to know something of Kadai, Del Crows, Orf, Suzuki, particularly those um, other uh, music education approaches. Mm, good. Um, so my suggestion is that you go to a seminar that Suzuki's putting on or that you go on the website of Godai and at least you read a book and find out what they're all about. And what the, the examiner is looking for in the practical exam is some evidence that you understand the use of off or the use of Kadai in your piano teaching. Mm. And most students who've got their distinctions are the ones who've been often done a Kadai seminar or an off workshop and have had established group lessons and tried using um, instruments, um, off style, that sort of thing. Mm. So that's another thing that needs to be studied um, as well. And and another, then, another great resource for that, sorry to interrupt you, Tess, is um, podcasts. I've actually recorded yes. podcasts um, with specialists in Dow Crows and Suzuki and could I an author on the list? So um, stay hey. tuned. Yeah, they might have already come out when those this goes live. Down. Could you put those up again sometime so that... Mm. Um, they're, they're, due, they're due to come out. Oh, good. Yeah, so I'll let you know when they are. Thank you. Then, of course, in the instrument-specific question, which is the fourth, but there are four questions in the ATMUS, only three in the CTMUS, um, and the CTMUS is two hours, the ATMUS is three hours. Okay. Um, the the instrument-specific knowledge um, is listed, and, of course, if you're a flautist or a trumpeter, it'll be slightly different from if, if you were a, a pianist. Sure. And in, from the point of view of pianists, you need to know um, how to teach pedalling and how to use um, fingering and those sorts of things. They're just a couple of extras. I mean, obviously, if you're teaching prelim and grade one, you're going to talk about pedalling and you're going to talk about um, fingering. But pedalling is not actually examined until after grade four. Okay. So... So that's the written exam. The presentation of the folio, as I said, is only 80 
um, pages, but it's distilled knowledge. It's crystallised. There's no padding. There's no photocopying. Right. There's, it's got to be what the student, what the candidate's um, philosophy is expressed in there. And it gives very clear directions as okay. to what's required. Yep. Then again, there's the two sections to the practical exam. Right. And um, without going into too much detail, the licentiate level, is that quite different or, again, the similar framework adding framework complexity? Is exactly the same. The right. framework is exactly the same, but um, it, it's up to eighth grade. Right. Now, anybody who's done the CTMUS and done the ATMUS has a thriving studio. Mm. They're usually well into their 40s by then. They're not going to put their life on hold to study the LT mass. Which That's is why the AMB have said they don't get that many candidates. I That's think. right. So yeah. Why write a paper or every year when you haven't got the candidates? Mm. I have to say that I just looked in the back before I came online. Of the, the, I don't know whether you realise, but in the back of the current syllabus is always the list of students who have passed the whether they're the performance AMAS or the ATMAS. They're all, they're all listed in the back, and there's only one ATMAS from the last year, and it was a trumpeter. Right, okay. That's why we should be ex encouraging um, teachers to do these qualifications. I'm just passionate about upgrading the skills of, of teachers in Australia, have mm. been for years, and um, you're helping me do that. Oh, well, um, likewise. I mean, the more we can all work together, the better. Um, but I did want to ask you about the state of pedagogy in Australia, particularly for, for, as it relates to piano. Because I, I was actually on a, on a Skype call to a class at uh, Southern Methodist University in America this morning. Is that Sam Holland? Um, Sam Holland and Christian Yost, yes. Um, and, you know, o over there, there is so many more opportunities for studying pedagogy. Absolutely. Uh, and as specific as piano pedagogy, so not just instrumental but piano. Yes. Um, over here, we, we just uh, – there are some courses, I know, but it's, it's very rare. So, very few. Um, yeah, very few. Uh, and I, I wondered on your thoughts on that and whether that's something that you think might change or it's just different over here. Well, I was doing it in the 1990s at WAPA, the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts. But I have to say in these sort of situations, performance is what is being taught. That is what is emphasised, <clears throat> yes. um, not teaching. And that's what it's all about. So, Which doesn't uh, make sense to me, given that there are so few performance well, jobs out in the world. Well, that's why I gave up and went private to do it, because I wanted to help teachers. And I couldn't do that if I was at the academy all day, every day. Mm. So I decided I'd do it um, from home. And um, I don't know any other reason. Um, it is costly. But the way to learn how to teach really is to find a mentor. Mm. I did that. Find a mentor. I mean, I had a lot of experience of school teaching at all levels, but I found a very good mentor in Stephanie Coleman, one of our top teachers, and she helped me. In fact, she was the one who, when I got to eighth grade, said, Tess, I don't want you to do the AMUS. I want you to go down the pedagogy line. I want you to start teaching teachers. She said, we are so short of people who know what they're doing to teach teachers. And she dissuaded me. Mind you, I had a physical problem with fingers as well and muscles. But um, I um, went down the pedagogy line and have loved it every minute of it. That's why I'm still doing it. <laughs> mm, absolutely. And you're so passionate. It comes across. Uh, and that's what I love about speaking with you. Um, so let's, we'll just wrap up. I've just got a couple more questions. Um, firstly, uh, are you familiar with how the AMEB's teaching diplomas compare to the DIP, uh, the ABRSM ones or the Trinity College London ones or ANSCA for that matter? Um, do you know much about those other courses? The, the short answer is no. I have had a quick look at them. But when I look at them, you usually you've got to do them online. Mm. Uh, and I really do maintain that any teaching is based on your relationship with who you're teaching. Mm. And to do it one-on-one -on -one, um, with someone who knows what they're doing is the best way to go. I could do Skype lessons. In fact, I've done some. But it turns out just being lectures, people scribbling stuff down. So if I do it, I then require that teacher to actually come so they can have a hands-on session to explain what I meant about phrasing or touch or tone or whatever. Mm. So. The answer is no, I don't have a lot. I mean, I could go online. I have in the past been online to have a look at it and I don't denigrate them by any way. If, if that's what people want to do, at least they're helping themselves in professional development. 
Absolutely. But what the Amy B has set up is an assessment system and they're saying, go and get yourself a mentor, go and get yourself a teacher, learn how to do it. Mm. You must, and I say to my students, my candidates, uh, um, teaching students, um, do it my way till you've found a better way. And when you've found a better way, come and tell me because I want to do it. <laughs> I love that. What a great, what a great quote. <laughs> That's a brilliant. Teacher is, uh, the best quote is, a teacher is always a learner. Yeah. Or should be. That's my motto. Yeah, uh, it's, it's great, Tess. Well, you've segued beautifully to one of my second last questions, I think. How do you go about finding one of these mentors who can actually teach this if you're in Australia? Now, that's the question. Because <laughs> it's pretty but, crucial, obviously. I don't know anybody else actually in WA who is doing what I'm doing. There are a couple of teachers who will put you through the CT must or AT must, but they'll say, this is what you do, this is the curriculum, this is the syllabus, go through, learn that, come back in six months' time or three months and I'll have a look and see. What I'm doing is, as I would do as a teacher's college lecturer, I'm mm. a teacher, I'm not a lecturer. I wait for the penny to drop before I present the next fact. Right. And okay. I need to see it in action. I watch my teachers teach. I help them. I go out to their studios, this sort of thing. So it's very hands-on. You've got to be committed you don't make any money. I don't know any rich piano teachers, least of all people who teach pedagogy, because you give hours more than you would normally in norm in teach, normal teaching situation. There's rarely a day goes past when I don't have an email from one of my teachers saying, this is the situation, what do I do? Very much like the questions you get on Facebook, mm, mm. on the, um, you know, art of piano pedagogy or the Australasian piano teachers mm. forum. We, we need to find a way to clone you, Tess. That's all we need to do. <laughs> a few people have said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I think that's all my questions. Oh, you mentioned to remind you about the word apt. App. Oh, app. A -A -P, app. App, yeah, there sorry. Is, I've just noticed this morning, to be in, in, in actual fact, right. there is a practice smarter with my tempo. It's actually an app that lets you choose your own practice tempo. It's um, available for both Apple and Android devices. And it actually um, is both from the Amy B. And it actually says, speed up, slow down, loop your repertoire or Amy B recorded accompaniment without changing pitch on your smartphone or label or tablet. Mm. It's got features like speed changing dial, tap BPM metronome. I haven't got a clue what one of them is. I'm going to look it up. Beats, standard, per, minute, beats per minute metronome, I guess. Oh, right. It's just a metronome, I think. Right. Yeah. And then it says standard metronome, which is why I thought it was oh, something. Okay. And looping. <laughs> What's a metronome if it's not beats per minute? That's what I thought. <laughs> okay, you've solved that one. So it can be used with the Amy B's recorded accompaniments and you can practice with an accompaniment any time at any speed. Oh, so great. I just thought that was interesting. Mm, absolutely. Well, and it's great to see the Amy B coming out with some apps because I know uh, the Abbey RSM certainly has a suite of apps to go along with their um, exams. So that's uh, great. It's the way everything's going, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Look, all right. It's been really quite exciting for me. I'm really glad that you're you're keen about pedagogy in Australia, and I'll do anything I can to help. Well, it, thanks, will be, it will be refu reviewed by the AMEB, but you can see that there are so few people actually doing the qualifications that it's going to be um, have to be someone's baby to do it. Mm, yeah. But well, I look, you know, you know, my passion as yours is is helping teachers um, uh, and that's why I do everything that I do because I think it's so important so um, it's great to have uh, another a kindred spirit on the other side of the country over there very much so <laughs> all right Tess now are you happy if um, if people uh, want to ask a question I know you're very very busy but um, if there's a question that you could answer would I just be able to forward that to you if they leave it on the show notes page that's a good idea that would that would be great because I know there might well be some some questions that come out of it um, I and mind if you give them my email i don't want phone calls but i don't mind emails emails okay. for me because my my um office where my computer is is next door to my studio and i'm in and out all the time okay so, great well that's really kind of you I'll, I'll pop the email on the show notes as well okay. and lastly did i forget to ask you anything that we we've we should have asked <laughs> i'll probably think of a hundred things when we've <laughs> live, but right at the moment <laughs> I can't think of anything in particular. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. Well, look, thank you so much again for your time, Tess. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I know a whole lot of teachers will appreciate it too. So thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Um, well, I'll sign off. And um, look forward to seeing you when I'm next over in Perth and Mandurah. Good. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Okay.
If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world, and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern, and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.